All right, we play. John Huizinga says, man plays. He did that great book on Homo Ludens. Man is a player. Man is a player. Again, like the last series, I chose this topic because I like thinking about it. I'm in it. I live it. And I'd like to share as much as I've seen with you. There are two ways of taking on this issue. One is academically, taking modernism in its various forms. And I'm only going to touch upon that because what I want to do is deal with it in terms of what I see, not the way it's developed academically. So, first thought, please notice, it's a cultural war not against our religious roots, but our spiritual roots. The difference between the two, of course, is that a religion is a body of beliefs that bring together people it binds them together, and they express that belief in a variety of ways. Some of the ways in which they may express it might be spiritual, but not necessarily. If spiritual means using the full force of your being to try to gain a better understanding and experience of the divine. Therefore, here is something interesting. Modernism, by definition, is turning your back <coughs> on the ancients. That's what modern formally means. <clears throat> a modern makes a pledge. I shall not go into the past beyond Bacon, and only occasionally with Bacon. Most often with Descartes and not too much that. They really move much more into Newton. That's their basic god. So let us play. Now look here. The usual way of exploring this issue in modern philosophy is to take the four expressions as it exists today, critical philosophy, historicism, phenomenology, linguistic philosophy. They are just various forms of reductionism and relativism. Now, reductionism means just that. If you take something noble and you can reduce it to other terms, terms other than itself, and express it in terms of terms and ideas less than itself, you are dealing with reductionism. Simplest way to deal with it, of course, is to say, if you're interested in um, studying man, you can say, for every, every distinctive experience man has, there's a biochemical correlate, there's something squirting somewhere in the body and, the, and in the brain. And therefore, you can correlate the different experiences man has with a different particular biochemical correlation with it. So therefore, if you don't like climbing Mount Everest, you can find what type of experience it might be to climb Mount Everest and find a biochemical correlate to that experience. Therefore, you can turn around and say, climbing Mount Everest is nothing other than putting the body or the psyche in such a way that you're going to squirt such chemicals it's reducing it to a biochemical correlate. Relativism is a, a modern expression of an ancient philosophy that's very current, which is um, Protagorean, Protagoras. Everything is relative to the observer. Knowledge is perception. Whatever seems true to you is true to you. For whom it seems so, whatever seems true to you is true to you. Whatever seems to me is true to me. And who's to say who's right or wrong, since each man's view is particular to their own particular viewpoint. Therefore, who can judge who's right or wrong? And words like this are quite popular. Now, all of these, in some way, deal with science. Behind it all is this word science. <clears throat> all of these forms owe allegiance to science usually science as expressed in physics. They all believe that science will be able to reveal the nature of our reality. They believe that science is going to touch and discover the very order of reality, express that order in laws of nature, and then we, of course, utilize it in a variety of ways. 
That's the role of reason. Oh, wow. See, that is the role of reason. All of this and everything we say is going to come down to this one expression. Role of reason. What is the role of reason? Look, see. Ah, here's a piece of chalk. If you discover something, if you discover something you find interesting, a possible idea, you generate a hypothesis about it. Maybe I can understand the way, let's see, the way something moves, and maybe I can generate a hypothesis about it. And so you generate a hypothesis about it, and then you set up a, some kind of experiment Right. You want to control that, you want to control everything so that only the variables you want to study will become visible. You want to reduce it to some measurable expression. Then you come to a conclusion. Now, what's most interesting about this is the steps through this should be an unbroken line that expresses itself ideally in a logical sequence. That's the role of reason. That is not the role of reason in Hellenism. Now, what do I mean by Hellenism? I mean that system of thought that started over here with Homer, expressed itself through the Greek philosophers, because that's what we mean by Hellenic, Greek, right? especially Platonic, the Platonic tradition. <clears throat> And we include within that what is sometimes called the Neoplatonic tradition. This, taken as a whole, is what is called the Hellene, or the Hellenic vision. What are its parts? It's not those. It's not those. Rather, working backwards, it's being able to master contemplation, the dialectic, dialogue, the use of mythology and complex allegories and analogies, cosmology, and especially this most curious and important word, understanding. Liquor. Understanding in the Platonic world is totally different than this. Totally different from this. And part of our goal tonight is to see whether we can pin that down, that difference, because in that difference everything follows. This is sometimes expressed in terms of the, the issue between reason and faith. Now, Plato, in the Republic, builds a whole system where he's dealing with four different cognitive functions. Image thinking, belief, and the images have their are the basis of the, pardon me, the beliefs are the basis of the images. Then there is this curious word, understanding, and from that, knowing. All of the arts of Plato, the arts, all of the arts that are used to train the philosopher king fall under that word. Now, there's an interesting expression between this. The Platonic arts, these are the arts of the philosopher king, or it's simply the philosopher who seeks to rule himself. All of these arts, taken in its highest sense, by that I mean arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and sometimes it's hyphenated astronomy harmony, and dialectic are called the quadrivium, the four. There's another set called the trivium, grammar, rhetoric, and logic.
The interesting thing you see is that these are two ways of expressing reason. These are two ways of expressing reason. This is the trivium. This is the quadrivium. They're totally different ways of expressing reason for one basic and fundamental difference. Rhetoric, and, uh, rhetoric, grammar, and logic are all you need to become a social, political, in that everyday sense, man, generic man. And the person who expresses this are typically a Cicero. And in the, uh, in the humanistic period, this is uh, Petrarch, probably the, the, the uh, most perfect example of it. In the Renaissance, correspondingly on this side, is Pico and Ficino. These are called Neoplatonists. These are, they're also humanists in one sense. But these are pure humanists over here. I would like to stay on this for a moment and see why they're so different. In every one of these arts called the quadrivium, every one of them, there are two parts to it. Every one of them has two parts, a higher and a popular or a lower. The higher arithmetic is not counting, one, two, three, four, but raising that most interesting of all questions, what after all is the nature of the one in itself? To ask that question, obviously, is not the same thing as teaching people arithmetic on the level <coughs> of, would you please go through the procedures that will allow you to master the use of numbers in various combinations. Geometry in the same way. Geometry, the lower part, is what is taught in the schools, which is how to handle different kinds of geometric figures and discovering the rules of their combinations and what axioms are necessary and propositions are necessary. Definitions, etc., to pull together into a unity. The higher aspect of it in the, Repl in the Republic it is to learn to contemplate, to draw the mind away from the world of becoming to the world of being. Whatever difficulties you encounter in this curious thing called contemplation is the very study of astronomy on the higher level. Therefore, Plato takes a look at this and he says, through Socrates, of course, he's to Socrates, he says, the understanding is what man has which must turn from the world of becoming, the everyday world, and turn it upon the world of being. Being. Magical word. Major, major word. Major word in this whole system. That is called reality in the symposium. When one breaks through and has a vision into the nature of reality, that experience is experienced as pure beauty or the perfection of beauty. That's the whole goal. What is it? The whole goal of the quadrivium, in the hands of Plato and the Neoplatonists, is to awaken the understanding so we can move from the everyday world, train the understanding and prepare it for vision. That's understanding. That's what he calls it. In the end of, <clears throat> the end of book six, he says, oh, he said, oh, we're going to have to come up with a name for this. And he talks about there may be a little difficulty in deciding on what it is. He says, but let's not worry about it. Let's call it understanding. That's the key. That's the passageway into this world of Neoplatonic thought. What is it? It's using the understanding through these disciplines to train it, to awaken it, in order to prepare it for vision. What kind of vision? A vision into the nature of ultimate reality. Now that's not this kind of reason. That's not this kind of reason. This kind of reason is orderly, 
it addresses itself to uh, learning how to uh, write properly and communicate properly. It has a great interest in um, the magnanimous man of Aristotle, the, the uh, goal of the magic man. Magic in the sense that that's the goal of Aristotle, become a magnanimous man, become an idol in society, be able to speak eloquently, to be able to be a social being, to be most fully a man. That's not this. That's not. Socrates can't be accused of that. He's over here. Now, I have a couple of very interesting lines I would like to uh, read to you about um, how these two figures are contrasted. Pico, Pacino, and over here, our good friend Cicero and uh, Petrarch. And uh, I'm going to quote from a very beautiful book, which I often enjoy looking at, uh, Giordano Bruno by Francis Yates. So let me just, I really think that it could be extended because it's such a nice way of representing these two types of people in history, kind of archetypal, very much like what Jung does in his uh, study of personality types when he picks uh, Origen and Tertullian as the basic models for archetypal representations of modes of thought and ways of relating to reality. Um, the two traditions appeal to entirely different interests. The humanist's bent is in the direction of literature and history, and he sets an immense value on rhetoric and good literary style. The bent of the other is towards philosophy, theology, and also science as originally conceived. That's my comment, originally conceived. For Pico, I'm skipping. I'm on page 160, 161. For Pico, the dignity of man consists in man's relation to God, but more than that, in man as the magus, the magic with the divine creative power. Above all, it is their relation to religion, Christianity, that the difference between these two traditions is most profound. The humanist, Cicero, of course, and uh, Petrarch, of course, it only falls for Petrarch since he's the only one who could be a Christian. The humanist, if he is a pious Christian like uh, Petrarch, uses his humanistic studies for moral improvement, studying the great man of antiquity as examples of virtue from which the Christian may derive profit. It is quite otherwise, I'm on 162, it is quite otherwise with Neoplatonism, which claimed to, re to, to present a new interpretation and understanding of Christianity. Especially the way it's developed by Pico and Ficino. And of course, he puts Erasmus later in it. I should get you a, a, a quote on Erasmus because uh, he uses Erasmus as well. Um, yeah, here we are. Pure humanism could turn in a religious direction and towards a religious and theological attitude. And the clearest case of this is Erasmus. Erasmus is completely humanist in his whole outlook. Outlook, He believes in polite learning, good letters, good Latin. And he believes that the golden age will come when there is an international society of politely learned people all communicate e communicating easily with one another in an international language of good Latin. He's a pious Christian. And he moved with the well-educated people. They use classical learning for its good moral teaching or moral examples. 
He has absolutely no interest in dialectic, metaphysics, natural philosophy. He scorns them in his great work, The Praise of Folly. Or we can put it this way, now that we develop this, you see, we can say, on the patriarchs and Christians, they have already settled in their soul or their mind the problem of God with faith. Therefore, there's no need to go over here. Therefore, all they can need to do is express this. This is the tension in the modern world. This is the tension in the modern world. This is the tension between church and state. In our culture, the church and state have been divided, and I think uh, it's worth considering that they made a deal. And the deal they made is the state doesn't interfere with the church, the church doesn't interfere with the state until recently. All right, what does that mean? That means, therefore, the social institutions of education funded by the state are interested in developing this kind of an educated man because it will not generate any criticism or hostility from the religious community. This would. Therefore, the goal of education in our culture is to develop people who are informed. You want to inform them. You want to make sure they become social animals. You want to make sure they can speak properly, they can write letters properly, they can do everything. This is the goal, grammar, rhetoric, and logic. Not move them over here. For this is not to inform, this is to transform. This is a genuine Western development of spirituality. And anyone who moves into this direction and tries to take this as a basis for communicating and building a curriculum around it runs great risks. For the basic reason that part of our culture funds public education and they don't want to fund public education that goes against their own religion. Therefore, we have a tension and a battle between them. How did we solve it? We'll ignore this. Not only will we ignore it, we will look for all those philosophical systems that, in one way or the other, depreciate this without knowing it, deride it without mastering any part of it, in order to make this the respectable part of education. And so as we finish our education and get dressed up in monk's clothes, in medieval monk costumes, and get our degrees, this is our goal. If, however, you move over here, as one person once said, God better help you. So, <laughs> excuse my humor, that's my humor. Okay, now look here. Let's see another way that this can express itself. I think this tension between this two shows itself up in a very interesting way. Not necessarily as phenomenology or linguistic philosophy or anything else. Our culture, the people that come into the schools, into the colleges, are all taught one system and only one system alone. Our culture is saturated with one idea. We make sure everybody gets it. It is our local religion in that sense of a belief, cultivating a belief in order to bring about a worldview from which we can express everything else. It's one subject that everybody who goes through uh, high school and college, say college, if you have four years of college, if you have four years of high school, if you have eight years, right, you have 16 years of education, it is likely, it is likely that you have at least 12 continuous years of studying one subject and one subject alone. Any subject you study, no matter what it is, will always be introduced exactly in the same way, and that is history. That is our study. Our culture roots itself in historicism. What is that curious thing, historicism? Well, I talk to people involved in this. They're some of my colleagues. And they defend it, you see. Now, I often ask them, what if we were to take our people and take that 12 years and put it over here? Why not study classic Greek? Why not share into this study? 
Why not even take them through a real history to show them the tension between these two instead of a watered down version which, which totally ignores these issues and obscures them for very good political reasons. Now what kind of history is it? Because history is a broad category. I think I have a way in which to represent it from the people who teach it and I talk to those people who are the subjects of it. Therefore, I've expressed it in a very simple form, and here it is. I hope you can read it. I'll represent it. Each period of history is the result of tradition working itself out in the present. All right, here's the present. There you are. All right, this is a period of history you're in. What's the present? It's the result of tradition working itself out. That's what it represents. And that is nothing other than people in the present interpreting, they are interpreting the past, that's what they're doing, nothing other than people in the present interpreting the past, and you find yourself in a history which is nothing more than people keeping alive their interpretation of their past. Now, that's very interesting. You find yourself in this history. This is a period of history, right, which we can say 1990s. Right. That's nothing other than people in the present. Right. And they're all taught to do the same thing, to interpret their past. Ah. And in that interpretation, you find yourself and you do your understanding. In that act of interpreting, you find yourself and you do your understanding. This is what our people are taught. This is what they're taught, understanding is. Now let's make sure we understand what interpreting is too. Whenever you get involved in any kind of study or discussion, and for whatever reason, you add something to it that isn't literally there, or ignore something that is there and depreciate it, and make a summary statement of that, that's called interpreting. Part of this, therefore, takes the alternate form. Each period of history is different. Each one has its own laws working itself out, and therefore you can't compare one period of history with another, because each is unique. Each has its own conditions operating on the moment. And as a consequence, there is no point in comparing one against the other since they're all unique. And since they're all unique, obviously it follows from this that therefore all cultures are relative. to the perception of the people within it. <clears throat> now, people who are taught this belief, obviously, walk away from that with an under, with somehow they have to, from this year after year after year, they then have to come to some view of themselves and the mind that they have. Now, what kind of view do they have of the mind and themselves? Well, no comparative analysis because each period is unique, conditions are different, each particular culture goes through its own phases, there's no point in comparing different phases and different things. 
Therefore, just as you might say, each person views something from their own viewpoint. And no one has a better viewpoint. So too, each one of these can be represented as a period of history. And therefore, everyone is, is unique. And therefore, there's no need to look for anything beyond that. Therefore, the view they have of the mind is knowledge is perception. Because this is all perception. It's all relative to the observer. What does that do then? That gives them a view of the nature of reality, which is you can't get close to it, you can't understand it, it's not an object worthy of reflecting on. For everyone has their own particular and totally unique. Therefore, the view of the mind is that it's a interesting kind of phenomena where everyone has their own private world and their own private dream, which is very much like what Wittgenstein said. And <clears throat> therefore, the view they have of themselves is inconsequential. That's the steps. These are the steps to nihilism. Nothing matters. There's nothing significant. There's nothing worthwhile <clears throat> to throw all your energies into because there isn't anything there that's worthy of it. Now, let's go further. Went through this, right? We talked about Cicero, Petrarch, Pico, Ficino, the split between the trivium and the quadrivium, the division within the state, peace in the state, don't challenge. We don't challenge you, you don't challenge us. The next level of our great culture is, therefore, let's have education and entertainment that never touches on anything vital. Because what's really vital? What's really vital is whether or not the mind is capable of seeing into the nature of reality. That's the only thing. Therefore, the real issue is the role of reason. Role of reason in the Neoplatonic and the Hellenic world is that it must be cultivated or it's not going to be utilized in its fullest capacity as a vehicle for seeing. Ah. As we noted before, Petrarch on the one side, Pacino and Pico, behind it all is the issue of Christianity. Now, what's most interesting about our age, and I think we're going to go through the most interesting period of time that I think is possible to participate in. I can't think of any period more exciting than this one. Christianity has emerged after 2,000 years they first had the view that all of their works together came together as a unity. Then, series of criticisms. All these, criti well, every mark I remake, by the way, comes from theologians who are reputable theologians who represent various denominations. Then they shifted to, no, 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 you can't say there's a unity to it all since Paul is so much different and John, Paul and John are so much different from the others. Therefore, there's really just a unity of three of the Gospels, the synoptic. Well, then there was an interesting work by several people, especially Bolton. He said, look here, there's something else going on here. And that is, since you've now separated out Paul, right, Paul and John, from the other three, Mark, Matt, Luke, there's something extremely interesting going on. And that is, even though you might say these fit together, synoptic, they fit together, they all joined into a unity, that's really not the case, later thinkers came along and said, because, look here, because when you contrast Luke with Mark, you find something quite remarkable. Mark has parables, they're esoteric. Luke has parables, they're not esoteric, they're not addressed to a small community, they're addressed to mankind. Therefore, the exoteric, open, Mark, esoteric, confined to a small group. Mark has parables that are esoteric and miracles and the passion. Luke does not. He has something that Mark doesn't have, and that's called the sayings of Jesus. 
The sayings of Jesus are the material found primarily in uh, the common material that's found in Mar. Pardon me, common material that's found in Luke and Matthew called Q. Mark does not include the sayings of Jesus in his gospel. Now a whole body of scholarship has been running on this point now. And what is the sayings of Jesus? What is its origin? Why did Mark leave it out? What's the significance of these statements, especially since the Q remarks or the sayings of Jesus can be addressed at 50 AD? Whereas, of course, the first gospel is somewhere around 70 AD. The latest analysis of the sayings of Jesus, the Q statement, shows very clearly that it belongs to a body of literature, wisdom literature, that is cynic and stoic philosophy, Hellenistic philosophy. And that Jesus in Galilee and uh, Decapolis, which are Hellenistic cities and founded by the Greeks, was the center of much of Cynic and Stoic philosophy. We know the names of them. We know where he visited. That's where he did most of his good work. When he went to Judea, he got in trouble. Therefore, there's a whole new view of Jesus. And what does it mean? It means this, you see. This whole tradition had the assumption that Christianity was the larger body and included Judaism. It was perhaps even a reform movement or a revolt against it. Whichever position you take, that was the connection. There was an intimate connection between these two. Modern scholarship, again, not by people who are outside of the faith, but people who are reputable in the field and represent certain uh, denominational thinking of Christians, now have to come to the conclusion that this is not true. This is a myth. What have they come to now? Something far more interesting, that Christianity is a part of Hellenistic philosophy. Now that's staggering. Because that means then, if you want to study Christianity, you should study the parent from which this is a part. You should try to discover how did Christianity get such a stoic and cynic philosophy? And what was its contemporary forms? How similar was it to the lifestyle of Jesus? You could see all of these things as an expression of Hellenistic philosophy occurring at the time. What does that mean? Enormous consequences to that. It's separating it from Judaism. That's the biggest thing that's happened in many, many years. Now look here. At one time, you see, Christianity, Christianity, could include within itself Neoplatonic philosophy. It included it. It included it up to the 15th century. Actually, 16th century, excuse me. Right. And it wasn't until Valla, a very great humanist at the time, who knew Greek well, Latin well, he looked at the material that was called the writings of Pseudo-Dionysius, Dionysius at the time, who was said to be the companion of St. Paul. And he said, excuse me, these writings are all forgeries. We have to call them Pseudo-Dionysius. They're not genuine. What did that do, this minor little thing? Well, St. Thomas Aquinas, Albert Magnus, people like that, especially St. Thomas Aquinas, quoted Dionysius 1,700 times in his Summa Theologica. What was the impact of that? It separated, it separated the writings of Dionysius from the core of Christian thought. Even though it formally developed it, molded it, influenced it for 800 years. There was another thing that was interesting. Early Christians thought that they could absorb Christianity, pardon me, that Christianity could absorb the Hellenic period under the assumption that there was a parallel tradition going on. One revealed by faith, one revealed partial, they called it partial revelation brought about by understanding. They could line up their philosophers, they could line up their prophets, they could see correspondences between the two, and that was called the dual tradition, dual revelation. 
That was a major thought. Now, St. Augustine accepted it, Lactanius accepted it, the Church Fathers accepted it, and therefore they could say one more thing which was totally interesting. They could show that some of the writings of the Christians anticipated by many hundreds of years the writings of the philosophers. Therefore, they could feel confident that they had a revealed system of theology that could compete with the Greeks and yet had the same origin since they thought both of these points met at the time of Moses. That was called the dual tradition. And that went on until the 17th century. Isaiah Casabando, or Casa, Casoban, in the 17th century, took a look at this claim and said, excuse me, gentlemen, everything that you're doing is quite interesting, but the dates are all wrong. You got them all wrong. He reestablished a dating system, and he showed that this hypothesis must be rejected. What did it reject? It rejected, therefore, the need in the universities to study these people. Therefore, it devalued these thinkers, and therefore they didn't play any major role in the culture itself. It was confined in some places to universities and seminaries, but it no longer played the major role it once had. There was a period of time in the 16th century, especially the 16th, early, uh, early 16th century, that many bishops, a very nice number of them in France, thought that the best way to understand Christianity was the Neoplatonism, and there was no doubt about it in their mind. Since Ficino, Ficino, who we mentioned before, translated all of Plato in uh, the 16th century, and his Plato was the ruling Plato for hundreds of years, he translated into Latin. And he translated the whole corpus, he developed the whole thing. And he was a churchman. He was a churchman. He was a canon of the church, he was a churchman. And therefore, they didn't see any reason why a person couldn't simultaneously be a Platonist as well as a Christian. It was accepted until Casabando came along and said, excuse me, the hypothesis upon which you rise resting. Therefore, they dropped it. What are they dropping? They're dropping the richness of a tradition that molded them because they want to keep this one idea that Christianity Scholarship can assert this true, that Christianity is intimately linked with Judaism and is its successor and can represent itself, therefore, as the fullest maturing of it. Wait a minute, modern scholarship, what's it doing now? In the last 15 years, no more than 15 years, it's showing that this is a myth. This is true. If this is true, then all of this now can be returned to. And if that's the case, if all of that can be returned to, then there must be a revival of Neoplatonic thought. And here's the big problem. And a chap by the name of Mack did a beautiful book called Q. He realizes this and he deals with the implications of it. And he says, you know what that really means? Painstakingly, he comes to this argument. And let me tell you how he concludes. It's a very interesting conclusion he does. Here, he does this. Since there are good arguments to reject from the sacred scriptures, all but Q, Q is what's genuine. Well, then he said, what's other than Q? Well, there's the parables, miracle stories, the passion. Passion, of course, means the, uh, the arrest, the trial, the crucifixion, and the, that's separate from the uh, post-resurrection scenes. Q has no passion material. Q has no resurrection story. The new gospel that's been discovered of Thomas, Gospel of Thomas, in the Nakamati texts, 35% of Thomas is Q. Thomas has no passion and no crucifixion. Mark, the original gospel of Mark, the earliest dating, the uh, texts that are from uh, the fourth to the fifth century, do not have a crucifixion. It all ends at 16.8. The last 12 lines have been added by other people and they have a pretty good idea, curiously enough, about who did it and where it was done. Therefore, no Easter. 
No Easter. No passion trial death. What is it essentially? Q. What's Q? Cynic and Stoic philosophy. Implication. What's this other stuff? The mythical expression, using the word mythical in the best way, the mythical expression of a cynic and stoic philosophy. Bang. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> Christianity, therefore, you can conclude by this argument that this material, the parables, the miracles, the passion, the crucifixion, pardon me, the resurrection, is non-historical material that was added many, many, many years later, in some cases three to four hundred years later, and therefore it's essentially a mythical account of what was essentially a Stoic and Cynic philosophy that was current at the time of Jesus. They know the places where it was studied, taught, it's the very same cities that Jesus went through with his earthly ministry. Therefore, what's the conclusion? There are two parts of Christianity, the mythical and the philosophical. Philosophical is Hellenistic. The mythical can express the local beliefs, both from Ju Judaism and Gnostic uh, redemption myths. Thank you. Done. Curious? That's where it's going. And if it goes in that direction, what is the implication? It's enormous implication, isn't it? We have to redesign our curriculum. The impact on science is going to be interesting, too, which we could spend a little while on, but I ran out of time. And how Goodall fits in this and other people of, of our contemporary thinkers is very interesting. Yes, pardon me, I interrupted. Go ahead and speak on that. Well, um, the idea of a myth, it's, it's really central to understand what a myth is. It's not mythical in that trivial sense. It means you're expressing something in a way to try to express it so that some element can be captured in an in a imaginative way that contains some truth but cannot be taken literally. That's what a myth is. That contains within itself certain archetypal expressions of the ideas represented. Now, this whole development of scholarship is nothing other than Christian scholarship turning upon itself and trying to purify itself. They went through a long period with, like, a, when they went through the, uh, the quest for trying to discover the earliest text to get the most reliable text for translations. They gave that up when they found that the text uh, dated 350 already had in it codes, three dots representing what is added or doubted and suspect. They already had established ways of dealing with the material, which indicated very clearly that interpretation was a part and parcel of the entire operation. And therefore, when some copyist had three dots along the margin, that meant he thought this phrase, bounded by two sets of three dots, is doubtful then you follow copies that were copied from that, and those, that passage may be dropped out. <laughs> or other signs to indicate there's something that needs to be added, and someone later adds it. So therefore, the earliest texts they found have put an end to that quest, because that too is no longer tenable. That is say, what does that mean? That means that Christianity, strangely enough, from the earliest days, was a man-made, was a, is a man-made religion. Out of his own being, he created it. Given this is its body of a legitimate material, the rest has been added by history, church doctrine. Very interesting, very interesting. How will this be taught? This doesn't come out of Pierre. I'm just reporting what's, what is available today in the best books. Uh, you went over the dual tradition quite rapidly. Um, is there, could you? Put more words on the, on the people that were in both lines and how, why they thought they were just at the same time? Um, I have a, uh, 
a list. They had alongside of Moses and the early Pentateuch works and the prophets parallel Zoroaster, Mercurius, Trismegetius, Orpheus, Aglophemus, Pythagoras, Philolaus, Plato, step by step by step, who they then matched then with people who on the Old Testament side could match up, which they thought were contemporaneous. This was accepted by all the church fathers from the second century on. It's Lactanius, you can see it in the third century. St. Augustine, you can see it in the fourth century. They all accepted this view. Therefore, they can incorporate it. And the most recent thinking is that it was consciously done to make uh, Christianity available to the Gentiles by showing the kinship of their thought with Hellenistic thought. The irony is, therefore, when it was rejected, they dropped the very thing that was used to bring in the Gentiles. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Matter of fact, <clears throat> it's in uh, a book I know okay. on page 42. Well, my question is, um, we're, talking, we're, we're dealing with our dreams, and our, our dreams, I guess, are something to do with our, uh, basically, our past, isn't it? Maybe I shouldn't talk about that. Let, let, well, right. let me just go back. Yeah. If I'm looking at my past, my past is inherent in my consciousness. I'm looking at my program, right? And I'm interpreting it in the current moment. Mm -hmm. And um, I might be totally aware of that spiral all the way back to the beginning, or I might have parts of it missing. Mm -hmm. And I think that we were looking at, when we were looking at our dreams mm -hmm. in the past, somehow or another, they, mm -hmm. some of my dreams have kicked in some of that mm -hmm. software that I've been missing. I think we made a, we made a, we made an assumption that um, if all of a sudden we became aware of that um, those little subroutines, it would sort of break us loose from that uh, that vision of the past. No, if I make sure I capture your thought, when we have a dream, I don't, the the material of our past is utilized in the dream. We then have the dream with these elements in it, and then we interpret it, we interpret that, ignore it or interpret it, within our understanding that has developed up to this point. Now, but that's, see, what's interesting about that way is that that is not, that will only perpetuate whatever the principles of interpretation are being employed. That's what will interpret, that's what will continue. Okay. The whole goal of dream analysis is to see it for itself and see whether the dream itself presents us with a drama which is similar to, which is also enacted in our present which gives us a history of our past unresolved conflicts embedded, embedded in the present. which which are embedded no which okay embedded in one sense but it's not embedded in that other sense uh, oh, sorry, I too. Uh, yeah it presupposes that you would then project into it using another language but the whole goal of dream interpretation is not to do this, is not to just interpret in terms of what you've passed or what you've been thinking, but rather try to discover what particular drama is being unfolded in the dream, look for parallels to each of the signs and the symbols in the dream so that you can, re you can reconstruct what may be the language of the dream. Now that's it's a this is, a, this is the course, as we know, this takes time, this takes effort, uh, takes practice. And then you want to see to what degree the, the present and your difficulties in the present are like the dream, and therefore if the dream is telling you something you need to know that you've overlooked. Ah! Okay. Something I've overlooked in the past? 
And that won't come out with, an, with the interpretation game. Because the interpretation game, usually you're satisfied by projecting into a dream whatever it is you, you have already considered. Well, so I'm just, I'm just keeping the, 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 the program I've had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I, if I get aware of the, of the, what is it we're talking about? What's the word you used on it, Don? If something was missing out of the past that I wasn't aware of, yeah, it's a tragedy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. Then I would feed it back, feed it into the current mm -hmm. moment, and I start mm -hmm. what, changing my software. So that's right. Something. That's right. Uh, from what we play with in dream analysis is that invariably there are things in your past that you never did understand and have not articulated. Among these, let us say this one is the unarticulated half half-articulated view of something significant to yourself about the nature of yourself or reality, and that's playing a role in the dream. You can't interpret it. You have to discover what it is. It's you have to decipher it. It's also playing a role in my current life yes. interpretation. Yes, yes, yes. So if I yes. get to the dream, if I get back there and modify it or find it or keep it out or mm -hmm. evolve mm -hmm. it, then my programming in the current moment will by nature. That's right. That's right. Okay. Right. That's right. Con condensed as we made it. Yes. This, this, this yeah. is a better spin on it because in the past it always sounded like if I got in touch with that significant event that all of a sudden it would evaporate. It really doesn't evaporate. It just, uh, it just uh, maybe... Oh, uh, oh. See, it doesn't evaporate. What would happen is that then you, can under then you want to find out why it existed the way it did mm -hmm. and if it was a particular belief under what conditions you were brought to believe it. So now it examines the nature of belief. Uh, why did I believe? What is it about it that made it believable? What in my past made it believable? Who made it believable? How did they make it believable? What in the circumstance led me to believe that this was true? Different kind of reflection on it, isn't it, than so, interpreting. So if there is a perfect path that, that basically gets you to the, the, the conception of the beautiful, all these mm -hmm. little X's and dots are sort of embedded in, in clouding it. So if, they were, if these beliefs were removed, might allow you to, is that, is that the next? Yeah, yeah. I, I think there's a kind of a, a principle. Um, you can't do anything significant until you feel good about yourself. Mm -hmm. You can't pray, you can't meditate, you can't create unless you're willing to accept yourself. That's and to the degree, degree that you can do it, to that degree you're open. And to that degree you can be creative on a higher level. So whenever there breaks when we can get into that state, well, then we, we can emerge. The whole thing, though, is uh, to the degree that these no longer are functioning, or a good number of them no longer functioning as be clouding, to that degree, then we're more likely open to more important and significant experiences. Not just experiences, understanding and experiences. They go together. Oh, thank you, folks.